120, Vivian Paley. Why does Jason say yiddle? asks Alex. Everyone looks like Jason who doesn't, who does not, who doesn't seem offended. He can't say his L's yet, I tell the children, so little sounds like yiddle. Alex laughs when I say the word, and Jason begins to chant, yiddle, yiddle, yiddle. He wants the children to laugh at him, and they do. Yiddle, 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 he continues, as long as they keep laughing. Now they begin to copy him. Yiddle, yiddle, yiddle. Who knows the name of this juice, I ask, hoping to change the subject. Pineapple. The children shout, yiddle, Jason says, and again there is laughter. <clears throat> as long as they, let's see. Mr. Paley really loves pineapple juice, I state, with um, emphasis. The yiddle game makes me uncomfortable. Who is Mr. Paley, Lily asks. My husband. Our husband is daddy, she says. Yiddle. My daddy is Richard, Eli says. Yiddle. The children have stopped responding to Jason. They want to tell their father's names. My daddy is Big Ted, Alex says. Yiddle. Jason, what's your father's name, I ask? Yiddle, you're lying, Jason, Alex shouts, suddenly upset. That's not his name. Jason whispers, Yiddle, then says, Jim. My baby is Jim, Lily exclaims, delighted. Jason, my baby is Jim, and your daddy is Jim. That's funny. My baby is baby, too, Jason t tells uh, Lily. She's Sarah. She spits up. Guess what? So does my baby. Both our babies is the same. I really, I am relieved to see the end of the yiddle game. Yet it points to an important change in Jason. He wants the children to laugh at him, which is to say he wants them to like him. When he entered school, fear set aside this ordinary desire. You can make connections with a few people, but unless you want everyone to like you, the bonds are shaky and undependable. Much of what I do that is good in the classroom is motivated, I am sure, by my desire to be liked by the children and by my assistants. I do not wish to deny this fact because it exerts a strong pull among us all. Unless we want to be liked by others, the classroom culture does not yield its magic. Staying a moment longer with my own case, what specific acts of mine are intended, no matter what other accompanying benefits, to cause my classroom family to like me? Everything that dem demonstrates my interest and affection. I listen carefully to people's ideas. I quote them to one another. I laugh at their jokes, though I didn't laugh at you, know, I admit, and try sometimes to make them laugh at me. I tell good stories and respond gratefully to the ones I hear. All of the above are certainly elements in a plan to encourage growth and change in others. But in addition, I am promoting my own cause in my secret fantasy. The children tell their fantasy, fantasy, their families, I like Mrs. Pally. She's the nicest teacher. When I see a new teacher, it was the principal's approval I sought when I was a new teacher. Um, I was afraid of the children. There were too many of them always surrounding me. People I was always supposed, I was supposed to influence and cause to improve in all ways quickly and visibly so that my principal would like me. Only as I began to seek the children's approval could I concentrate on individual needs and differences. If you want a certain person to like you, then you find out what makes him or her happy. I began to realize that I could not teach much to anyone unless the person liked me a lot. Jason's yiddle game is a sign that he wants us to like him. Why has he waited so long? During the first months of school, Simon and Joseph tried in every way they could think of to entice him into their play, but he refused. He was too fearful to care if the boys liked him, as was I in my early teaching years. There were too many people in this classroom that needed to be influenced. Jason could think only of self-preservation and control. Jason's most reliable tool has been the helicopter. Mine had been drills and exercises. Both Jason and I, as newcomers to a classroom, hovered over children without landing on their runways, without entering their fantasies. I cannot avoid my own premises and experiences, and I can only pretend to know Jason's, but he is a child who causes me to analyze myself and everyone else. In his visible confusion, he often clarifies matters for me. For example, my routine question, is there a helicopter in the story? intended to help Jason think about the effect of a helicopter flying into a story in prog progress did not lessen Jason's bewilderment. He may have heard the question simply as a sig signal 
to cease his activity without further meaning. Come to think of it, my question is misleading, since I have the printed story before me. I must already know if it contains a helicopter. A more honest response from me would be, there's no helicopter in the story, Jason. You must raise your hand if you want to be one of the characters in Simon's story. When the children began to put helicopters in their stories, he was then able to ask himself his own urgent questions. Will the author have power over me? Will I surrender a piece of it, of me, if I act in the story? Not all children respond with such intensity. For Katie, issues of power and influence seem to create new obstacles. This is a fortunate characteristic, but we are wrong to heap credit on her simply because she has fewer problems of this sort to overcome than do other children. Katie draws pictures frequently for her classmates and provides us with splendid examples of gift giving and niceness the very thing people do when they want to be liked. Yet, on the two occasions when Jason gave a gift, a helicopter picture for Arlene's story and a queen's cape for Samantha, the angels must have sung. Did Jason make those gifts because he wanted to be liked? I think knowing Jason, he was curious to know how he would feel. Wanting to be liked is a major commitment with far-reaching positive implications for school life, um, it is well to ask ourselves before denying a child certain kinds of behaviors. If the child is trying to find a way to be liked, is the behavior designed to make us laugh? Laughter is not enough for Jason. He seeks other connections. Do you have a helicopter, he asks Alex. No. He repeats the question moments later. Alex, do you have a helicopter? No. When Jason asks a third time, did you want Alex to play helicopter with you? My blades are broken. I have to fix them. As I resume my place at the story table, I hear Alex. Do you have a helicopter? What is Jason's question about, I wonder? Alex doesn't seem puzzled. I might get one. This kind? Yeah, I think so. When Joseph arrives, Jason begins to question him in the same way. What kind of helicopter do you have, Joseph? I don't have one anymore. Do you have a helicopter? Joseph stares at Jason. I didn't get a helicopter. Do you have this kind? No. Why does Jason continue in this manner? Perhaps he can now imagine himself playing helicopter with another child, but cannot imagine someone holding one of his helicopters. Even within the safety of a story, his helicopter is not to be touched. This must be a great struggle for Jason. He wants to play as others do and has made important beginnings. But at the heart of this play, his play is the helicopter, his helicopter that glorious private symbol he cannot share. Does Jason suspect, I wonder, that an even more glorious feeling await it, awaits him? The freedom to share his fantasy with another child.